I'm speaking in the dark. <laughs> there I am. How do I look? Better or worse with the lights on? Don't answer. Don't answer. Hey, if you uh, heard me speak and if you hadn't, bring you up to date. We took our older son to Wayne State. And so we dropped him off Thursday and spent Friday with him and off we went. So part of that though, we were at convocation, welcoming the new students, and my wife being the friendly lady she is, talks to the young man next to her and said, what are you going to study? And he, this young man is going to study um, biology and plant sciences. And that's a, that's a good major. So she said, are, you, know, are you thinking you're going to go to, to med school with that? Or are you going to do research? And as honestly as I can tell you, he says, no, I want to grow marijuana. <laughs> doesn't, that, doesn't that give you hope in today's youth to <laughs> study that? For real. Uh, so recently, our, our country has been rocked by unsettling events in the news. So I'm talking about the two shootings in Dayton and El Paso. I'm talking about the, the suicide with Jeff Epstein and, and all he was involved in trafficking. And, and to me, they're symptoms of a godless culture. See, if there's no God and I get mad at you and I don't know you, I just make the decision indiscriminately to, to shoot you. Where do you get off thinking you can end somebody's life just like that? Or where do you get off thinking you could use people to traffic them and basically enslave them for your own good? That is a symptom of a godless culture. I'm in charge. I don't answer to anybody. That's the world we're living and so this morning, I want us to think about how are we to, to live in a godless culture? To do that, we're going to look at Genesis 34, and we're going to see a godless act. Let me tell you up front, it's going to be ugly, what we're going to see, but we're going to talk about improper responses and maybe proper responses to that. So we've got a Bible, open it to Genesis 34, if you will, and we'll, we'll wrestle with that question, how do we live in a godless culture? Now, quick overview of Genesis, uh, God creates, Genesis 1 to 11, humanity pushes back. God creates to be in a relationship where he will lead and guide and direct our lives. And humanity goes, nah, I, don't, I don't think so. I'll go my own way. And that's most seen in Genesis 11. They create a tower and they're going to make a name for themselves. And, and God disperses them. And then he speaks in Genesis 12, actually the end of Genesis 11, to a, a couple, maybe Abraham and Sarah. As far as we know, they were just kind of happy pagans worshiping the moon God. Out of his grace, God chooses them and said, I'm going to work through you. And if you will follow me, I will make a name for you. In Genesis 11, the, with the tower, they tried to make a name for themselves. Guys goes, no, that's not happening. But Abraham, I'll make a name for you. In fact, I'll make your name great, but you're going to have to trust me. You're going to have to follow me. And to start, we're going to have to go someplace you've never been before. You don't know the culture. You don't know the food. You don't have a job. You've not, you just follow me. If you do that, I'll, I'll make you a great nation. I'll give you a descendants of, like you can't see. The thing is, Abraham and Sarah didn't have a son, didn't have a descendant. And so it took 24 years, but they finally had this uh, son, Isaac, and Isaac marries Rebekah, and they have a set of twins named Esau and Jacob, and God chooses to work through the younger son, Jacob, and he's going to continue his line, his lineage, he's going to make himself known through that, but, but Jacob's got a lot of problems. He is uh, deceptive, he, he falls back on lying and cheating, and he's ripped off his family, he's ripped off his brothers, and, and so he is a work in process. Uh, he goes back to his homeland and sees his uncle, and he falls in love with uh, Rachel, but the uncle tricks him and has him marry Leah, and it's a whole complicated mess, and there's servant girls. And so the, the long and the short of it is, Jacob's got uh, really two wives and, and two concubines, four women, 12 sons and a daughter, and they're on their way, um, settling in the promised land, and, and this is what happens with the daughter. Chapter 34, verse 1. Now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had born to Jacob, went out to visit the daughters of the land. And she just wants to go visit a friend. Can somebody go visit a friend in peace? Is that, is that too much to ask? Apparently in this culture it is, because verse 2 says this. When Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, the prince of the land, saw her, he took her and lay with her by force. Okay, that's a sexual assault. I want her, so I'm going to have her. Well, well, what is she not interested? That doesn't matter. What matters is what I want. 
See, that's a godless culture. I'm the center of the universe. I, I, I'm separated from God. I'm not getting my worth. I'm not getting my value from him. I better get life all I can here, get every kind of experience, and I want her, and I, if she's not interested too bad, I'm going to force myself on her. It is a pagan, godless culture. Right? But catch this, conflicted. He was deeply attracted to Dinah, Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the girl. Now, that's a funny way of showing love. Uh, and spoke tenderly to her. More evidence that Shechem thinks he's the center of the world. So Shechem spoke to his father, Hamor, saying, get me this young girl for a wife. And we'll talk. There, there's some uh, spiritual conflict that, that might keep that happening. But, but know this. Shechem just says to his dad, hey, pops, I need you to go get her. I want her. Hey, you, you go get her. So verse 5, Dinah's father, Jacob comes into play. Now Jacob, Jacob heard that he had, def- he had defiled Dinah, his daughter, but his sons were with his livestock in the field, so Jacob kept silent until they came. Really? Your daughter just got raped and you're keeping silent? What's the deal? You need to speak up again. This is wrong. You need to demand some kind of justice. But silence. Why? Now, this part, next part is admittedly speculation on my part. But Dinah was born of Leah. Leah was not the favorite wife. Rachel was. And we will see in a couple chapters that Jacob is not above playing favorites. He cherished the son that was born by Rachel. Maybe Dinah doesn't quite have the value because she was born of Leah and not Rachel. If that's true, Jacob has his own form of racism, doesn't he? You don't have as much value because you were born of that wife. You, because you were born of that wife, and we'll see this with Joseph, you have great value. No, 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 that's not what God says. God says every poor person has infinite value because they're created in His image. But we take God out of the picture and we start setting up values. You got value, you don't because you're this, because you're that, because you're this background, you're that background. That, that's racism and, and God would speak against that. Verse 6 then. Now Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. He wants to set up a deal. Let's get our kids married here. Now the sons of Jacob came in from the field, and when they heard it, the men were grieved, and they were very angry because he'd done a disgraceful thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter. Yeah, it is disgraceful. For such a thing ought not to be done. No, it ought not to be. These guys are angry. And their anger... For the moment, it's righteous, but it's going to get away from them. It's going to control them. It's going to take them to a really dark place. But remember, their, their father's been passive. Notice this, verse 8. But Hamor spoke with them, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Remember, he's speaking to the sons now, not the dad, because the dad's been so passive, he's abdicated his place. Please give her to him in marriage. Intermarry with us. Give her your give us. Give your daughters to us and take our daughters for yourselves. Thus you shall live with us and the land shall be open before you. Live and trade in it and acquire property in it. So what's the property? What's the problem? Why, do, why is this all this discussion about why can't they just get married? Well, God's got a problem with this marriage and it is not, let me underscore, it is not based on ethnicity. It is based on spirituality. God instructed His people not to intermarry because the other folks didn't worship the same God. They, they were pagan people. And God says, when you come together in marriage, you have got to share the value of worshiping me, the one true God. And this carries on in the New, New Testament. We're counseled in the Word of God to only pursue a relationship with someone who's a follower of Jesus. Now, I've got to tell you, I heard this my freshman year. Came to faith. In February of my freshman year at A&M, and 
uh, about March or April, I, the guy I was, had led me to the Lord and I were talking, I said, hey, I'm, I'm still writing this young lady back when she was a senior in high school and I kind of liked her and she wanted to have nothing to do with me, but I thought, I, you know, I'd try and keep my foot in the game. And, and, and he said, well, Andy, do you know anything about her spiritual background? No, I don't. And he lays it out, rolls out, Andy, you really ought to be dating only Christians because you're going to marry somebody you date. And so the Word of God teaches you need to be dating just Christians. So I thought, that's about the dumbest thing I've just ever heard. Because I wasn't doing that well anyway. And now you're going to limit my field? <laughs> Narrow it down? I don't think so. So I didn't buy this. I didn't. I didn't. So for, for 18 months or so, I didn't. I kind of dated whoever, whenever. And my junior year, uh, I won't go into it, but kind of my social network fell apart. And so I started getting more socially connected with this group called Campus Crusade now known as Crew, and I got so involved that I got my first little crush on a young lady. Um, I went out with her a couple times. She got to see me for what I was and wanted nothing to do with me, and, and that was a good decision at the time. I, I had a lot of growing up to do, but, but out of those two dates, I had the conviction I'm never going to date somebody who's not a believer again. I could see the difference. So if you're a single person, I beg you, would you make your first screen proven Christian character? What I hear is, when I was, especially when I was in campus community, oh, Andy, she is beautiful. She is beautiful. He is so hot. He is so hot. And, and the idea of I'll consider their character goes right out the window. People get emotionally involved and they get connected with someone who doesn't share the same values. And when you're trying to raise kids and you're just trying to decide how we spend our money and how we spend our time, you need to be on the same page. As parents, my wife and I have agreed that when our kids, one is leaving and one will leave soon, our hope, we agree that our hope that what is in place for those boys is a dynamic relationship with God. More than being a starter on the volleyball team, more than being first chair clarinet, more than getting a 32 in the ACD, this is in place because we think that's what they need. It's it's when we parented towards that. We had the same values. I, I would beg you. Don't go down that road because that is, that is why there's, there's a discussion here. Can our daughters get married? So that's the question on the table. And so verse 11, 12, Shechem also said to her father and to her brothers, if I find favor in your sight, then I will give whatever you say to me. Ask me ever so much bridal payment and gift and I will give it according as you say to me, but give me the girl in marriage. Okay, so, so the, the brothers have leverage. The guy says, I will pay you anything. I really want this deal to fly. My son wants your daughter, and, and, and he will be so sad, and he will be so upset with me. So I'm pulling out the checkbook. How big do you want the check? How big do you want it to be? The brothers have leverage. And listen to what they say in verse 13. So Jacob's sons answered Shechem and his father with what? Deceit. We're going to lie. We're going to misrepresent the truth. Why? Because he had defiled Dinah, their sister. So their anger has gotten out of control. It's gotten the best of them. And now they're justifying deceit. How's the deceit going to play out? Here we go. Uh, Verse 14, they said to him, we cannot do this thing to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised, for that would be a disgrace to us. Only on this condition will we consent to you, if you will become like us, and that every male of you be circumcised. Then we will give our daughters to you, and we will take your daughters for ourselves, and we will live with you and become one people. But if you will not listen to us to be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and go. So, here's the price. Every male, every man in your country has to be circumcised. Now, we saw in Genesis, the purpose of circumcision was a reminder of the covenant God had made with humanity. When you're circumcised, uh, remove the foreskin from the male organ, this is a reminder that, that God in His grace reached out to you. It's, it's a beautiful symbol. But these brothers are going to take it and twist it and use it deceitfully. And we'll see how in just a minute. Before we do... We get the reaction, verse 18 and 19. Now their words seemed reasonable to Hamor and Shechem, Hamor's son. The young man did not delay to do the thing, 
get circumcised because he was delighted with Jacob's daughter. Now he was more respected than all the household of his father. But now they've got to sell the rest of the men in the country on this idea. And that's, that's kind of a painful proposition. So, so what's the selling point? What, what is it that would motivate you to get circumcised? Well, here we go. Verse 20. So Hamor and his son Shechem came to the gate of their city and spoke to the men of their city, saying, These men are friendly with us. Therefore, let them live in the land and trade in it. For behold, the land is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters in marriage and give our daughters to them. Only on this condition will the men consent to us to live with us, to become one people, that every male among us be circumcised as they are circumcised. Here's the cell right here, verse 23. Will not their livestock and their property and all their animals be ours? Only let us consent to them and they will live with us. So here's the deal. If you guys will go in on this, we can mix with them and we can get all their stuff, man. Their, 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 their livestock and all their riches can become ours. Remember, it's a godless culture. What's in this for me? If you will do this, you can be a lot wealthier. These people, we can take them and we can take all their stuff and we become rich on them if you'll just get circumcised. Now, these guys are, are, are all in. Verse 24. All who went out of the gate of the city, listen to Hamor and Shechem, to his son Shechem. And every man was circumcised and all who went out of the gate of the city. So I'll buy it. Man, I can raise my net worth. I can increase my portfolio for a few days of pain. Remember, circumcision is going to be used deceitfully. And here we go. Verse 25. Now it came about on the third day when they were in pain, two of Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, each took his sword and came upon the city unawares and killed every male. There's the deception. You're trying to recover from this. We're really angry. And we're going to take out every male in the city. I don't know how you connect every male to that rape, but, but that's what you've done. See, when anger leads us to revenge, we never get enough. We take it way beyond. But they're not done. Verse 26. They killed Hamor and his son Shechem with the edge of the sword and took Dinah from Shechem's house. Is she there of her free will or is she being held there? We don't know. And went forth to do what? Verse 27. Jacob's sons came upon the slain and looted the city because they had defiled their sister. They took their flocks and their herds and their donkeys and that which was in the city and that which was in the field. And they captured and looted all their wealth and all their little ones and their wives, even all that was in the houses. Man, they, they go way beyond. And they take everything that that city has to offer. They line their pockets. So you give in to anger, you take revenge, <laughs> there's no control. And you step way, way beyond the limits of justice. Now, when, when Jesus was being arrested, Peter, one of his disciples, pulled out his sword and cut off a servant's ear. Well, Jesus healed the ear. But, but he said something to Peter. He said, careful. You live by the sword, you die by the sword. And basically, that's what Jacob's going to say in verse 30. Here's what he says. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have brought trouble on me by making me odious among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and Perizzites. And my men being few in number. Remember, he got 12 sons, and maybe they got some kids. They, 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 I don't know, what are they putting out? 50, 75? I mean, these are, these are peoples. They will gather against, together against me and attack me, and I will be destroyed and my household. You've taken revenge. That's going to cause revenge in them. It, it doesn't stop. But the brothers don't see that. But they said, should he treat our sister as a harlot? So when we started asking this question, we live in a godless culture that is filled with godless acts. How do we live? How do we function in a culture like that? Here's what I want to say. Between Jacob and the brothers, we should reject both passivity and revenge. In this injustice that we're going to see, we should reject both passivity and revenge. Well, thanks, Andy. You, you've told us not what not to do. Can you give us any insight on what to do? 
Yeah, I think I can. Let's, let's push forward into chapter 35. Remember that Jacob's concern is, man, people are going to be mad. We're small in number. How are we going to survive? Well, here we go. Verse 35. Then God said to Jacob, arise and go to Bethel and live there and make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, put away the foreign gods. So they've got some problems with idolatry. They are not totally fixated on the one true God, which are among you. Purify yourselves and change your garments. And let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make an altar there to God, who answered in the day of my distress and has been with me for wherever I have gone. So they gave to Jacob all their foreign gods, which they had, and the rings which they were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under their oak, the oak, which was near Shechem. So they're going to they're gonna caravan to Bethel. Man, they're targets. They're not very big. There's all kinds of people around. And I mean, this has got on the internet what they did. And people know. And there's a concern about revenge. But what happens? Verse, ver, verse 5. As they journeyed, there was a great terror upon the cities which were around them, and they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. God is all-powerful. God is able to protect His own. God is able to do what God chooses to do. And in the area of justice, God is able to bring justice. He's all-powerful. He's not limited. And I want to suggest when we think about justice, we first need to look to Jesus. At the crucifixion, He did not go passive. He's, Hebrews 12 2 says He endured the cross. John 18, when they came to arrest him, and they, he said, who are you looking for? And they said, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, I am. When he said, I am, he flat knocked the people down. The power of his name knocked people down. And he could have walked. But he stepped into that. Jesus was not passive. Nor was Jesus vengeful. They mocked him when he was on the cross. Excruciating pain. But his answer was, Father, forgive them. Jesus rejected passivity. And Jesus rejected revenge. But Jesus promised to bring justice. Six to seven hundred years before the coming of Jesus. Isaiah wrote about him. And I want us to look at those verses in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 42, 1. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth what? Justice to the nations. Verse 2. Now, here how he, here's, listen to how he's going to do it. He will not cry out or raise his voice. What do the politicians do? Man, they yell and they scream, don't they? Not Jesus. Not Jesus. He's not going to cry out or raise his voice. Nor make his voice heard in the street. Uh, a lot of times bring, people bring justice. They, they bring the hammer, don't they? Not Jesus. A bruised reed he will not break. And a dimly burning wick he will not extinguish. But he will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not be disheartened or crushed until he has established justice in the earth. And the coastlands will wait expectantly for his law. You bet they will. So we're rejecting passivity and we're rejecting revenge. But we are asking this Jesus who is committed to justice to lead us. And as we see here in leading his people, he can do all. He's all powerful. So, so I, 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 we're asking this question, how do we live? How do we function in this godless culture where we're rejecting passivity and revenge and we're following, desperately following Jesus' lead, seeking him to bring about justice? Well, what does that look like? Well, I don't know, because every situation is different. And every circumstance demands a different response of justice. And we look at the law's land, and we look at Jesus, and, and, and we ask, lead us in bringing about justice. Now, this is talking corporate. Okay, this is talking about culture, the godless culture, the violence, the anger, the racism that we see. And, and, but this also has personal implications too. Because you have relationships, and I do too, where we feel like we haven't been treated justly. I mean, I don't know about you, but I want to bring about justice. 
It was early in our marriage when my wife said to me, Andy, you have an overworked sense of justice. I mean, if I don't feel like it's right, I just cannot let it go. Dude, give it a rest. Now, here's why I say that. We're to work for justice. We're not to be passive. We're not to be vengeful. We're, We're serving the Savior who said He came to bring justice. We're His hands and His feet. And yet, we won't see justice perfectly until He comes back and sets His kingdom up. So I don't want to make us passive. I don't want us to make us vengeful. I want us to be active in pursuing justice. And yet, no, there is... People are disconnected. People who are living imperfectly, including me and you. There will be injustice, and we won't see final justice until Jesus comes back. We're rejecting passivity. We're rejecting revenge. And we're passionately following Jesus, purposely following Him, that He can show us what justice looks like in every situation. And what that means is we're going to have to put ourselves under Him to the point that sometimes it's even uncomfortable. We allow Him to change. We allow Him to take our values and, and, and shape and mold them. So, 1997, January, Hope and I went down to Costa Rica to go to language school. We're going to be uh, missionaries in Latin America, learn Spanish, then go to Chile. Within the first week, we had a talk from the director of the institute and said, look, North Americans, Canadians, Western Europeans, listen, listen to me. There is a different value system in Latin America. It is people over efficiency. It is relationship over time. Now you efficient, type A, task-oriented Americans and Canadians and Europeans, you're going to have trouble with that. And if you can't live with that value system, go back home. So it's about week five. I'm going to a Bible study at the church and there's uh, about 20 guys, and, and one man in particular, his name is Don Ricardo. Well, Don is a title of respect in Latin America. And the Bible study finishes, and Don Ricardo comes up to me, and he says to me, Le gusta baseball? Now, many of you don't know Spanish, but you, you understand baseball, don't you? That, that's baseball. He just asked me, do you like baseball? And I say, "See." Si? because that's all I can say. <laughs> He's very dramatic. He says, a me? Me gustan los Colorado Rockies. Well, I don't know much Spanish, but I, I can figure that out. And then, and then the Rockies that year had a bunch of Latin players who were power hitters. So he says, Andres Galarraga, big cat, boom, home run. Vinny Castilla, boom, home run. Dante Bichette, boom, Home run. And there's about five of them. He goes right down that thing. Do you know why we had that conversation? Because that was the limit of my Spanish. But remember, this is a culture where it's what? People over efficiency, relationship over time. So he's living this out. And I'm putting myself under those values. And honestly, I like that part of it. So six weeks later, comes along and my Spanish is up and running. I need a haircut. And he's a barber. So we talk, and we decide, tomorrow at 9, get my hair cut. Well, I know better than to show up at 9. I show up at 9.30. 9.30 is not there. 10, 10.30, he rolls in a little after 11. Now, in the United States, what would we have done? Hey, man, tell him I'll call him. I'll come back. But remember, I, I'm choosing to put myself under these values, and it's what? Relationship over time, people over efficiency. So I'm, I'm not leaving. I'm waiting. So finally, about 11.15, I'm there. Remember, this is a 9 o'clock appointment. I've been there since 9.30. And I get in the chair, and it's time to get my hair cut. And you know what he wants to do? He wants to talk. He wants to see how I'm doing. Tells me how good my Spanish is, how good my wife's Spanish is, how much they love having us in the church, blah, 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 blah. And I'm thinking, cut my hair. Cut my hair. But what are we doing? I know I need my values to change. So I'm intentionally putting myself under Latins because I want their value system. Hey, you want to see justice? You and I need to intentionally put ourselves under Jesus. Why? That he might change our values. Will it be uncomfortable? 
Uh huh. Will it stretch us? Uh huh. Am I glad I did what I did in Latin America? Absolutely. So here's what I'm asking. As we live in this unjust culture, that you and I intentionally put ourselves under Jesus, knowing that He is the one that is going to bring justice that we talked about in Isaiah 42. We're going to reject passivity and we're going to reject revenge. And we're going to believe that Jesus is going to lead us. In a minute, I'm going to pray. And we're going to sing a song. And the first line of this song is, do you believe the world's broken? Let me be a spoiler. The answer is we do. We absolutely do. But the song is going to go on to talk about one who is worthy. Would you engage in that song at because He is the one who is worthy in all aspects. We we're talking about justice, to bring justice. Would you sing it out of the certainty that if we place ourselves under Him, He can change our values? Let me pray. So, Father, uh, we do live in a broken culture, a broken world. We do. Um, but we have one who promises justice who, and who will bring perfect justice one day. Uh, but we're not there. We, we lean towards passivity. We lean towards revenge. Neither of them are good. Um, we sing this song as a prayer to you. Lord, we want to put ourselves under you. And that's going to be hard. It's going to make us squirm. We're not going to be comfortable. But would you change us from the inside out? That would be your hands and your feet of justice. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand.